here in chapter nine, I think. Yeah. So last time we talked about uh, stoichiometry, right? And uh, <clears throat> we talked about sort of basic steps in stoichiometry problems. Uh, there really is, for most stoichiometry problems, really kind of four steps. You want to make sure you balance the equation. You want to make sure that whatever they give you, uh, you convert to moles. So again, um, a lot of times uh, that is sort of a grams to mole sort of conversion that you do a lot. And a reminder that obviously grams to moles, uh, that's our molar mass that we use to do that. They may not always be sort of a gram to moles, maybe some other unit where you might have to do a few conversions to get yourself there. But ultimately, sort of whatever they give you, you've got to get into moles. The real reason for that is uh, the third step, which is really the stoichiometry step. That is the mole to mole relationship. The mole to mole relationship comes from the balance equation is the coefficient. So if we had a balance equation like 2a plus 3b gives you 4c, uh, we could say there are two moles of a for three moles of b. Uh, we could say there are two moles of A, gets us four moles of C. Uh, three moles of B gets us four moles of C. So again here, uh, we could do these sort of stoichiometric equalities. They're nothing more than the actual coefficient from the balance equation, uh, which is why obviously step number one is really important to make sure that you have a balance equation. The purpose of stoichiometry, as we talked about, is really is a conversion factor. Um, it is because in a lot of cases we're given information about somebody in the reaction that we're not interested in, and we need a way to go from that uh, sort of reactant or product uh, to something else in the equation. So again, instead of sort of looking it up in a table, we use the equation and the coefficients as the uh, conversion factor. Four there is, at this point, you will be in moles. So you want to convert it to some other unit. So again, on the back end of sort of stoichiometry calculations, a lot of times um, we are doing molar mass again to go from moles back to grams, uh, which is a very common sort of thing. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> okay, so I think we did an example last time. So. We're gonna skip the TI example, and we didn't get this is sort of where we left off, right? I think, yeah, not ballpark. So we're gonna talk about uh, limiting reagents, uh, which we have not right in this class. So uh, limiting reagents are sometimes referred to as limiting reactants. The idea of limiting reagents or limiting reactants is the idea that when we do a actual chemical reaction, both of the reactants are not going to be used up at the same time. So there's always sort of one reagent where you basically will use it up completely. And that reagent is what's known as the limiting reagent. So the limiting reagent is the one that gets used up in a chemical reaction, completely used up. And then there's usually a reagent where you have plenty of, and that is what is referred to as the excess reagent. So the excess reagent is pretty much the reagent where you have so much of it that there's actually some left over uh, when the reaction is complete. Um, <clears throat> so you have some left over. So for example, the experiment we did the other day, uh, the, it was potassium iodide, you weighed out the little solid and that was the limiting reagent. You took like 50 milliliters, but you used 25 milliliters of the other reagent and you had plenty of it and you had some left over when it was all said and done. Um, so that is the excess reagent. So why is limiting reagents and sort of excess reagents really important? It is always the limiting reagent, which is the most important in terms of how much product you can make. So for example, pretty simple explanation of that is if you have A plus B and you're making AB, 
if A, for example, here was our limiting reagent, once this guy gets used up, there is absolutely no possibility of making any more product. Obviously, you need A and B to make the product. So as soon as that gets used up, uh, pretty much all product production will sort of cease. Uh, so it is always a limiting reagent which determines how much product you can make. So in a sort of limiting reagent probe, which we'll talk about here in a second as to how you can sort of recognize it as a limiting reagent problem, uh, it is always sort of an extra step that you have to kind of take in the calculation to figure out uh, which one's the limiting reagent because that again is the one that's going to help you determine how much product that you will make. <clears throat> so as I mentioned, <clears throat> They typically, reagents are not used up equally. There's always one that gets used up and one that you got uh, leftover of. So how do you know it is sort of a limiting reagent problem? If you think about some of the problems that we did previously, uh, we were pretty much given just one piece of information. Maybe there's something about the reactants, about the product, and so forth. So in a limiting reagent sort of problem, you know it's a limiting reagent problem when you are given enough information to get to moles of each reactant. So that is like the big thing that you want to look at when you look at a problem that's a stoichiometry problem. If you see for sure that you're given, for example, both of the reactants, enough information about both reactants to get to moles for both of the reactants, then it definitely is a limiting reagent problem. Now, if you have sort of a basic stoichiometry problem like we did previously, where you're only given one piece of information about a reactant, uh, then it's assumed that that reactant is the limiting reagent, so you don't have to worry about this step. But definitely, if you're given enough information to get to moles, and again, they could be in any units, but if you have those right units to get through conversions to moles for each of them, it definitely is a limiting reagent. The good news is pretty much you do the same steps that we talked about in a basic stoichiometry problem. Uh, the only difference is you got to take one additional calculation to figure out which one's a linear agent. So that's sort of the additional step uh, that you have to take uh, along the way. As I mentioned before, uh, there's also the excess reagent, uh, which again, uh, you have plenty of. Uh, again, you also have some of that left over when the reaction is done. And that's also a very common sort of question sometimes you're asked in these ones, which is how much of the excess reagent is uh, sort of left over at the end of the reaction. So, for example, here, if we're going to make sort of workout buddies, right, uh, we obviously need one guy, one girl. And we can see that in this case, we are going to be limited by the guys in this case. So this would be our limiting reagent, and that's going to basically determine how much product we can make. We can also see that, you know, if we made three partners there, we would also have kind of, in this case, two of our excess reagent uh, left over as well. So we could very easily uh, determine, you know, how much of that is left over. So let's take a look at uh, an equation like this. And Let's talk about sort of the steps that we would follow to help us determine uh, which one is the limiting reagent. So let's just say, for example, here, give you here. Let's say we're going to do uh, four moles of S, like it says, and twenty moles of F two. Okay. <clears throat> So if we were to start with this amount here, this was our starting amount of each of those reactants. First off, what we would recognize is obviously in this case, we have moles of both reactants. So this tells us it is a limiting reagent problem for sure. So here's really the steps that you can follow. And one way to sort of tackle these problems is just like we did before, Pretty much any method you choose, you want to make sure we have a balanced equation, uh, which we do. 
we still want to convert whatever they gave us into moles, uh, which it was already in moles. So much like a basic stoichiometry problem, if it's already in moles, you don't need to convert it. But if it's in grams or something like that, you need to use the molar mass to convert it. So at this point, the first two steps are really just like a normal sort of stoichiometry problem. But at this point, what we want to do actually in a limiting reagent problem is one approach is right about here. We're going to figure out the limiting reagent. So we're going to kind of do a small little calculation to figure out the limiting reagent. Now, one way that you could do that is this. We basically can take either one of our reactants, either in this case, the sulfur or the F2, and we could do just a basic stoichiometry problem that says, if I want to use up one of my reactants, how much of the other one would I need to put in there to do that? So for example, in this case, if I want to use up all of my sulfur, how much fluorine is needed to do that? So this is just going to be just a basic little stoichiometry calculation to do that. So we would start with our moles of sulfur, which in this case is four moles. We're going to do our mole to mole relationship between sulfur and the other reactant, which in this case is a one to three relationship. Remember, we want to cancel out our sulfur. So one mole sulfur, three moles of F2. And again, that's the stoichiometry, the coefficients from the balanced equation is where we get that from. Here, the moles of sulfur will cancel. And that will tell us we need 12 moles of fluorine is needed to do that calculation. First off, any question on that little calculation? So basically just picking either reactant and we're gonna do a stoichiometry one to figure out how much of the other one we need to completely use up all of the first reactant. So at this point, what we wanna do is actually compare, we wanna compare the amount of fluorine needed to the amount of fluorine we started with. And in this case, do we have enough fluorine? If I need 12 and I started with 20, do I have enough? I do have enough. And because I have enough, what that means is the F2 here will be my excess reagent. And by default, this guy would be my limiting reagent. Any questions on that flow calculation? <laughs> now, I'm going to show you the other calculation, which, once again, you don't necessarily have to do both of these calculations, but just to show you if you chose the other reactant. So, for example, let's say we decided that I wanted to figure out how much sulfur I would need to use up all my fluorine. So, you could alternatively did this calculation. How much... Uh, sulfur is needed to use up all of the fluorine. So in this case, what we would do is we would start with our fluorine moles. We would use the same relationship from the equation, which once again is one mole of sulfur is three moles of fluorine. And that would give us uh, 20 divided by three, 6.67 <laughs> moles of sulfur is needed to do that. So if I chose the other reactant and did the calculation, similar calculation, I would then at this point compare the moles of sulfur to the moles of sulfur I started with. Now, when we compare those two, I started with four, I would need 6.6. .6. Do I have enough of the sulfur? I do not. So it tells me basically the same result that the sulfur is our limiting reagent and the fluorine is our excess reagent. So <clears throat> once again, it tells us the same thing, obviously not the same numbers, but tells us the same thing uh, that I do not have enough. Uh, which once again should tell you that that sulfur be limiting. So when you compare those two, the starting amount to how much you need, if you have enough, then that guy is the excess reagent. If you compare the starting amounts to how much you need and that you don't have enough, 
then that guy is the limiting reagent. Any questions on that calculation? Once again, you don't necessarily have to do both of those calculations. You could choose either one. They both will give you the same results in terms of which one's the limiting and which one's the excess. All right, so now that we did this sort of little step here where we figured out the excess reagent, really the rest of the calculation is just like a normal stoichiometry problem. We're going to then do the multiple -mole relationship. And we always want to make sure, obviously, that we use our limiting reagent. And we always want to make sure that we use the starting amount of our limiting reagent. So, again, you want to go back to the starting amount of your limiting reagent in this case, which in this case was four moles of sulfur. And now we could do the mole to mole relationship between sulfur and SF6, which looks like it's a one to one relationship. So, one mole of SF6 gives us one mole of sulfur. That means that we would get four moles of SF6 produced. Obviously, if we wanted grams, we could use the molar mass of SF6 and figure out the gram, uh, which would be kind of the next step there, right? Moles to grams if you need it. <clears throat> First off, any questions on any of that stuff there? Now, that would obviously be as we've been talking about our theoretical yield in moles. And like I said, you can always use the molar mass to get your theoretically yield in grams. Now, another very common question is how much of the excess reagents left over? So depending on sort of which one you chose here, you may actually have what you need to do that, or you may have to do this calculation again. But earlier we saw that we needed 12 moles of F2, uh, 12 moles of F2, and we started with 20 moles of F2. So the moles of excess reagent would be for our F2. We started with 20 moles. We needed to use 12 moles. And again, that comes from this calculation that we did here. And that means that we have eight moles of F2 left over which once again, if we wanted to know how many grams that would be, we could use the molar mass and calculate the grams. Any questions on any part of that? So one approach is to uh, do what we just did here, which is basically the exact steps that we did before, except that you do one additional sort of calculation there in the middle to figure out the, X, uh, the limiting reagent. Uh, another approach that's a very common approach is uh, you do two separate stoichiometry problems, one for each reactant to make the product. And you basically figure out which one made the least amount of product, and that would be your limiting reagent and also your theoretical yield. So that's a very common approach as well. Basically, just take both reactants, two separate stoichiometry problems from each reactant to the product, and whichever one is the least would be your limiting reagent and your theoretical yield. So that's an alternative approach. There's many ways you could actually solve these type of problems. Any questions on any part of that there? All right, so let's try some here, maybe. All right. All right, so that's basically what we just talked about there. <clears throat> All right, so why don't we try one here and see what happens. So in this reaction, we want to... Uh, know which one's the limiting reagent, and we want to calculate how much iron to sulfide would be produced if we started with 6.83 grams of iron and 9.34 grams of sulfur. And once again, we'll give you some numbers here. Iron is 55.85 and sulfur is 32.07. All right, take a couple minutes here. Basically follow those same steps with the additional step. Again, balance the equation, convert to moles, Find the limiting reagent, mole to mole relationship with the limiting reagent, and moles to some other unit. All right, take a minute to see what you come up with. <clears throat> <clears throat> Okay, let's take a look, see how you're doing. So once again, first off, 
uh, when we read this problem, uh, we're given uh, 6.83 grams of iron and we're given 9.34 grams of sulfur. So that definitely is enough of each of those reactants to get to moles. So that is the key that know that this is a limiting reagent problem and you need to figure it out at some point. Uh, so we're just gonna really follow our same steps here. Uh, once again, uh, we have an equation and it is balanced. We want to then convert to moles, which we do need to do in each of these cases. So we would go to the periodic table, get the molar mass, and we'll do that first here. We'll take uh, 6.83 grams of iron using the molar mass for the periodic table, 55, 85 grams per mole of iron. Going to get us uh, 6.83 divided by 55.85. Uh, 0.122 moles of iron. We'll do uh, the exact same thing here for our sulfur. So 9.34 grams of sulfur using the molar mass from the periodic table there of sulfur, 3207 grams per mole. And we will end up uh, with here 9.34. 0.34 divided by 32.07, uh, 0.291. So uh, 0.291 moles of sulfur. So let's talk first off about this. Uh, hopefully no questions on converting that to moles. So this is, again, a very common mistake that some people will make at this point when they do these type of problems is they'll just go with, well, that guy's the smallest number of moles, so that is the limiting reagent. And it may always turn out to be that in a lot of cases, but you cannot make that determination just simply looking up the moles here as to which one's the smallest or not. You do have to take into account the stoichiometry of the equation. So it is a very common mistake that people make and they get to this point and go, oh, well, that's the smallest, so that's going to be the limit. So that's not what you want to do here. You do have to do some type of calculation to figure out which one is the limiting reagent, regardless of sort of your starting moles in each of these cases. So we can think of these two values, obviously, as our starting moles here, uh, what we are starting with. So this is the point where we are going to figure out the limiting reagent, and we're just going to do a basic stoichiometry problem. So in my case, I'm going to figure out how much sulfur I need to use up all the iron. And again, you could chose the other way around. So basically what I'm calculating here is how much sulfur is needed to use up all the iron. So we will start with our iron, which is 0 0.122 moles. We'll do the mole to mole relationship between iron and sulfur, which from the equation here is a one to one relationship. That means for every one mole of iron, I have one mole of sulfur, the moles of iron cancel, which means 0 0.122 moles of sulfur is needed. First off, any questions on that calculation? You obviously could do the exact same calculation doing the opposite, where you figure out how much iron you need to use up all the sulfur, basically a similar calculation. The key at this point is we now want to compare how much we need of sulfur to basically how much we started with. And we wanna see, do we have enough? And the answer in this case is, do we have enough? We need 0 0.122 and we have 0 0.291, so we do have enough. And basically just based off of that, that means that this guy would be our excess reagent because we have enough. And by default, that means in this case that the iron would be our limiting reagent. Any questions on that? <clears throat> All right, so now that we did this little calculation here to figure out which one's our limiting reagent, we're now going to use our limiting reagent to figure out how much product that we're going to make. Also really important at this point that you go back to the starting amount of your limiting reagent to do this part of the calculation. So we will go with uh, 0 0.122 moles of iron. Now we're going to do the mole to mole relationship between iron or limiting reagent and our product, which happens to be one-to-one -one as well. Pretty easy stoichiometry here. One mole of iron to sulfide. In this case, we're looking for how many grams, so we're gonna do one more conversion. 
we're going to use the molar mass of FES, which in this case is just adding those together. So 5585 plus 3207. Eighty-seven ninety-two would be our molar mass of FES. So using the grams up on top, eighty-seven ninety-two grams per mole of FES. The moles of iron cancel. The moles of FES cancel, and that gets us about ten point seven grams of FES would be produced in here. Because this is a product and how much we produce in this reaction, based off of the equation, this once again would be our theoretical yield. Any questions on that? Yeah. It should be the uh, molar mass of FES. So it has one iron and one sulfur, adding those together. Yeah. And that would come from the periodic table. Other questions? <clears throat> So again, this method, as you can see, is really the same four methods that we did before, just with that additional step, balance the equation, convert to moles, additional step of finding the limiting reagent, mole to mole relationship, and convert those to moles. Now, if we wanted to as well, and we were asked, which I think maybe we were in this, which is how much of the excess reagent left over, we could actually do that from our calculation. Uh, we actually were lucky enough that we chose correctly here for this calculation that we actually have the number we need. Once again, if you didn't choose correctly, you would then have to kind of come back and do this calculation for the excess reagent. Uh, but in this case, we know from our calculation there in step number three that the excess reagent we started with, uh, which in this case was sulfur, we started with 0.291 moles, which we started with. We would need what we calculated here, 0 0.122 moles to use it all up, which means that we would have left over at the end of this reaction, 0 0.291 minus 0 0.122, 0 0.169 moles of sulfur, which if we want to know how many grams that is, we could use the molar mass of sulfur, 3207 grams per mole on the periodic table, and that would get us about 5.42 grams left over. Which again, is a very common question sometimes asked. Remember that we started with 9.34 grams of sulfur. So in this particular reaction, we use about three-ish or so grams of basically sulfur. How much iron should be left over at this point? Zero, basically. Yeah, so it's a limiting reagent, so it all should be gone at this point. Any questions on any of those sort of steps there? Okay, let's try another one then and uh, make sure. Here. Are we good? Yeah. That's the one we just did. Hopefully you'll agree with us. Uh, all right, let's try this one here. Uh, let's say we... All right, if we took uh, 622.7 grams of NH3, molar mass 1703 grams per mole, and we allow it to react with 1,241 grams of CO2, small two, uh, molar mass 4401 grams per mole from the periodic table, uh, which of the two are limiting reagents? Calculate the mass of our product, which is the molar mass there. So it's nice to give you the more mass of everybody. And also how much of the excess reagent will be left over here. So take a few minutes here, see what you come up with. Okay, let's take a look, see how you're doing. So once again, uh, we're given 622.7 grams of NH3 and 1241 grams of CO2. Uh, so once again, that is both reactants given to us. We definitely can get the moles of both of them. So again, 
This is how we know it's a limiting reagent problem. We got to take that extra step to uh, figure it out. We're just going to roll with our same normal beginning. So we got an equation and it's balanced. Pretty much now we need to convert into moles. Uh, they were nice enough to give us the molar mass from the periodic table. So NH3 is 1703 grams per mole. And our CO2 is uh, 4401 grams per mole for CO2. It's going to give us uh, for NH3 622.7 divided by 1703. Uh, we'll call it uh, 36.56 moles of NH3. We'll also go 1241 divided by 4401. Uh, we'll go 28.20, uh, we'll call it, moles of CO2. Once again, these really just represent our starting amounts, which we do need to have so we can basically do our next step, which is the living reagent part of the calculation. So in this case, I'm just going to pick the first one listed there, and I'm going to figure out uh, how much... Uh, CO2 is needed to use up all the NH3. And again, you could have done the other calculation as well. So in this case, uh, we're going to uh, go with uh, 36.56 moles of NH3. We're going to do the mole-to-mole -mole relationship between the two reactants from the equation. It is two moles of NH3 gives us one mole of CO2. So we're gonna take basically 36.56 and divide it by two. And that gives us 18.28 moles of CO2 is needed in this case, as these guys would cancel. Once again, at this point, we're going to compare between how much is needed to how much of the CO2 we started with, which is down there. Good circle. And again, in comparing these two, we do see here we have enough, right? So we do have enough. That means that the CO2 here is our excess reagent because we have enough. And by default there, our NH3 should be our limiting reagent. Any questions on that one there? <clears throat> At this point, uh, we will now use our limiting reagent. And a good example, as you can see, not the smallest number of moles, right, is our limiting reagent in this particular case. So we're going to use the moles of NH3 in this case, which is uh, 36.56 moles of NH3. We're now going to do stoichiometry between NH3, our limiting reagent, and our product here. And from the equation, it's a two to one relationship. So two moles of NH3 gets us one mole of our product. Moles of NH3 cancel. In this case, we were looking for how many grams. So we're going to do, you could get an answer here or you can continue on with the calculation. Uh, we're going to use the molar mass here of our product, which was also nicely given to us. Uh, which is 6006 grams per mole of our NH22CO. Those guys will cancel. That's going to give us 3656 times 6006 divided by two, uh, going to get us about uh, 1098 grams of our product here would be produced. This again is a product and based off of the equation of the linear agent, which means that that would be our theoretical yield. First off, yeah. Yeah, in this case, I believe they asked for grams, so that's why we went there. If they wanted in moles, you would actually just get an answer at this point and stop. And that would be your theoretical yield in moles. So it does depend on the question. So if they want moles, you would stop at that point. They want grams, you would go one more. Frankly, if they wanted any other unit, you would continue on with the you know, conversions until you get to whatever unit they sort of asked for. Yeah. But I would say, obviously, grams is a very common sort of ending point, and uh, moles can be as well. Other questions on that? So the other thing that was asked was in this problem as well, how many grams of our excess reagent is left over? 
So in this particular case, again, we chose pretty good because we actually have that calculation. Once again, if you chose the opposite where you did uh, how much NA3 you needed for CO2, you would then need at this point come back and do this calculation here to get to that number. But we're actually okay here because we chose correctly, got lucky. So excess reagents left over, uh, which in this case is our uh, CO2. We started with uh, 28.2 moles of CO2. From our calculation right here, we know that we need to use 18.28 moles as needed. That would give us 28.2 minus 18.28 about 9.92 moles of CO2. And again, in this case, they actually wanted grams, so we're gonna use the molar mass of CO2, which we had earlier to do that. Oops. Moles of CO2. And that would get us about uh, 436.6 grams of CO2 is left over in this case. In this case, we started with right about 1200 grams of it. We got about 400 or so left over. So, roughly, there's seven to 800 grams we use in this reaction. Once again, here, NA3 would be zero, ideally, or pretty close to zero at the end here. Any questions on any of those steps there? <clears throat> Question on limiting agent problems. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we'll go with basic soil chemistry like we talked about last week. Yeah. Other questions? All right, so let's take a look here then, I think. It's the one we just did. All right, so let's talk a little bit about yields, which we sort of touched upon, but let's officially talk about it. There really are sort of three different types of yields that we come across in a reaction. Um, the first one is what we've been talking about here. So whenever you sort of do a calculation uh, based on the limiting reagent to how much product that you would make, either in a basic soil chemistry problem or in a limiting reagent problem, uh, whenever you figure basically how much product you made based on what you started with and the balance equation, that is your theoretical yield. Your theoretical yield is really your maximum yield. It is uh, really if everything went perfect, uh, you didn't drop anything, there was no side reactions. Uh, you know, that is exactly how much you should have gotten out in that reaction. Now, when you actually do an experiment, kind of like the one we did last week, Many of you saw, like, I got a lot of yellow that won't come out of my beaker, right? And those type of things, or there's yellow on my glass stirring rod and things like that. That is all your product. It's not going to end up in your final numbers, right? So along the way, you know, things do happen. Side reactions occur. Maybe you can't get everything out. And that is what is known as the actual yield. And that's actually what you got. So when you physically did the experiment, it is what you got. That is what you're going to calculate when you go to lab and you throw your thing back up on the balance today. And uh, that would be your actual yield, how much yellow was on your precipitate or your filter paper in this case. In textbook problems, the good news is the actual yield is typically given to you. So typically in a textbook type problem or those type of problems, uh, usually somewhere in there, they'll say, hey, you produce this much of this product. So they'll typically give you the actual yield. The theoretical yield, you oftentimes need to calculate yourself, either it being a basic stoichiometry problem or a limiting reagent problem, but somewhere you have to calculate yourself. By the way, yield can only be a product. Yeah, so we don't have any type of yields for reactants. So it's only in the stuff that's being produced as a result of the reaction. The third type of yield is the one we're oftentimes interested in, which is the percent yield. The percent yield is when you take the actual yield, what you actually got, you divide it by the theoretical yield, and you times it by 100. 
a percent yield, we're actually looking for a high number, like near 100 is good. Over 100 is not so good. Yeah, so you can get over 100% yield, but it usually means you kind of messed up somewhere along the way. So a very simple way where things could sometimes get messed up is like the experiment we did, right? You filtered that thing onto the filter paper, right? And your filter paper had your solid, but your filter paper was soaked, right? It was wet. Yeah, so if you didn't wait for that thing to completely dry, hopefully in five days it did. <laughs> but if you didn't wait for it to completely dry or put it in the oven and you were kind of in a rush and you went and waited while it was still relatively wet, what you're going to count as your product is actually like water weight, right? So you got a much higher actual yield than you should have. And that is a way that you would get over 100%. And usually it's not, again, a good thing that that occurs. Uh, so ideally, whenever you do a pro procedure like we did there, you definitely want to make sure that it hopefully dries out. We'll cross our fingers that hopefully it did dry out. All right, we're going to actually skip this one here. We're going to do the next one, I think. Let's roll this string through. All right, so let's do this example here. You take 100 grams of ammonia and you react it with 100 grams of carbon dioxide and you produce 120 grams of our product. What is the percent yield? These are really the same numbers we just used in the previous problem. So 1703 for NH3. Uh, CO2 was uh, 4401. And our product here was uh, 606, I want to say. All right. All right, let's take a few minutes here. Calculate percent yield, which is actual over theoretical. Okay, okay, let's, let's take a look since we're getting to the end here. So in this case, we're looking for the percent yield, uh, which is actual divided by theoretical times 100. Uh, in this particular case, it told us that we did produce 120 grams of our product. Uh, that would be our actual yield. So once again here, we do need to calculate the theoretical yield using stoichiometry. Uh, we are given grams of both reactants, which once again does tell us it's a limiting reagent problem. So we have an equation that's balanced, just like we did previously. We're going to convert each of those guys into moles. So using the molar mass from the periodic table, uh, 1703 grams per mole for NH3 gets us uh, 17.0, no, no, 1700, divided by 17.03, gets us 5.872 moles of NH3 and doing the same thing here for our CO2 using the molar mass from the periodic table, 4401 grams per mole CO2, taking 100 divided by 4401, uh, gets me something here, try that again, 100 divided by 4401, uh, 2.272 uh, moles of CO2. Once again, it's a good idea to remember that these are your starting amounts of each of those. So here we will do our extra step in this type of problem, which is to figure out the limiting reagent. So in this case, I'm going to figure out how much CO2 is needed to use up all the NH3 that I'm starting with. So starting with the NH3, 5.872 moles of NH3. Again, doing the mole to mole relationship between the two reactants from the equation. We see that for every two moles of NH3, which is the coefficient, we get one mole of CO2, which means uh, 5.872 divided by two tells us we need not 2.936 moles of CO2 is needed in this case. Yeah. Any questions on that part of the calculation? <clears throat> now we want to do the correct comparison, which once again is this is how many moles of CO2 we need. This right here is how many moles of CO2 we started with. 
do we have enough? We do not, right? So because we do not have enough, that means that the CO2 in this case is our limiting reagent. The NH3 in this case is our excess reagent. So once we have that basically determined, we want to go back and use, once again, the starting amount of the CO2 or the limiting reagent to figure out how much product that we would produce. So using the starting amount of our limiting reagent, which is 2.272 moles of CO2, we'll do our limiting reagent to our product, which in this case is a one-to-one -one relationship, which is nice. So one mole of CO2 gets us one mole of our product. And once again here, since our actual yield was in grams, we're going to get this guy to grams as well. That way they're both in the same units. Um, so we would use the molar mass for the periodic table, 6006, which is the same number we used in the previous problem. And that would tell us here 2.272 times 6006 divided by one, basically, gets us 136.5 grams of our product here, which would be our theoretical yield, which is the bottom part of what we need. Any questions on that there? So to figure out our percent yield, we're just going to divide our actual divided by our theoretical. So our actual is given to us, which was 120 grams, divided by our theoretical, uh, which was 136.5 grams times 100%. And that would get us uh, 120 divided by 136.5, about 80. 7.91% yield, not terrible. Any questions on any of those stuff? So really percent yield is just really taking the theoretical yield, either linear agent problem or regular stoichiometry problem and taking the actual yield and divide it by. By the way, when you do calculate something like percent yield, uh, although it is very common that the units here are both in grams, which you could definitely do, you can really calculate it in any units, as long as they're the same. So you can do moles divided by moles. You can do any two units. As long as the top guy and the bottom guy are basically the same units. That's to wrap up this chapter. Any questions on percent yields, limiting ranges, stoichiometry?